as we set up the stage here today, if we could have uh, Deb Copenhaver come on up. Let's have a round of applause to Deb. We sure appreciate uh, the crew help setting this up. We had one of a kind designs. We stole a couple of benches from them here. It was nice of them to help us out. Deb, go ahead and have a seat right there. I'll give this mic to Jack. And Jack, we sure appreciate your help. Yeah, thank you for uh, Milton for the presentation you made, kind of heading us up to uh, our little cowboy reunion here. And I am from the Ellensburg Rodeo Hall of Fame, and uh, we have a lot of those pictures and stuff that uh, Milton has in our archives, and our goal is to eventually get a museum and stuff so that you can come and visit all of our archives. I'd like to introduce to you now two-time world champion saddle bronc rider, Mr. Deb Copenhaver. Thank you. Deb told me a little story on the way to town today, just about when he was getting outside of town. Something came to his mind, and he says, you know, i got to get to the rodeo off to see which horse I grew. <laughs> Deb, which horse do you think you'd really like to have had? Should have been Export, Devil's Dream, Snake, and there was a parcel of them that you... One thing about this country, it made good bronc riders. There was good bucking horses, and good bucking horses will make you ride. And there was a parcel of them at this rodeo. This is something that Ellensburg can be proud of. It's the great bucking horses that's been through this arena. There's a picture of Deb that is one of my favorites, and you see it in a lot of publications. It's Deb on uh, the great mare from the Christians and Brothers, Miss Kalamath. It's here at Ellensburg. It shows Ellensburg uh, Rodeo behind it. Tell us a little bit about the Bronx Miss Kalamath. Um, well, I really don't like to think of her that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I come, I came over here that day, and of course, the first thing I did, I went to the office. And Guess what, I had Miss Klamath in my shoe. Anyway, uh, she hadn't been rowed. Nobody qualified on her. And that day, I had her sighted in as good as anybody could have one sighted in. And I went, she just kind of went out, come back, and just right at the whistle, she tripped and she went down. And just as, the whistle was blowing, she was hitting the ground, and I kicked my feet out of the stirrups. This is a true story. I kicked my feet out of the stirrups when she was in going into the ground. Carl Dossie was judging, and he disqualified me, and I said, well, what for? He said, well, you lost your stirrup. Well, I said, you've got to kick him out sometime. <laughs> and but that day, I always felt I should have qualified on her, but I'm not here to complain. <laughs> well, thanks, Deb, for that, Mayor. We have a, in our Hall of Fame, we have another great bucking horse from the Christensen Brothers who is also in our Hall of Fame. Uh, that horse is War Paint, and you drew War Paint several times, probably, didn't you, Deb? Tell yeah. us about that. Well, I went, the first time I was on him was in the Livermore, and that uh, was in his in the, probably when he first cracked out, I won Livermore on him, and uh, then I was on him two or three times, and I gotta tell you this, it was at Redmond, Oregon, and at that time, the Christensen brothers, Hank had always had, um, whoever drove war paint would lead him around the arena on a pickup horse, and just lead him around like that and show him off and go back and stuff him in the chute and throw your saddle on him. And this day, I was really cocky. I'd reach over and I'd spur him. As I'd go along like that, I'd reach over. Boy, and I had his old lip a-popping. 
I guarantee you, he was ticked off. Put him in the chute. And Jackie Wright says, Deb, now don't forget. He said, when, when you ask for him, he said, you make sure his head's looking back this way. If you've got, he said, if his head's sticking out over that date, he'll take that rear at you, and right at the top, he'll root his head and boom. But I was cocky. I thought, it, I don't care where his head is. <laughs> anyway, I asked for him, and his head was like, and he ran out of there. And this shoulder's hurt ever since. <laughs> well, Deb, you were born up in the Columbia Plateau country up around Creston, Washington. Tell us a little bit about your... Uh, how your parents and grandparents, how they got up in that country? Well, uh, I, I lost my southern accent, but my, my grandparents, my grandpa Steve and uh, grandma, I can't say her name now. Anyway, they came from Virginia, and they came out in 98. And I got to tell you this. Grandpa came out here and he bought a half section of land up there, Sherman. And then he went back to Virginia and he sold his place and they loaded on what you call an immigrant train. And he had nine kids <laughs> and they set up help housekeeping in that boxcar and there was nine days coming west. And my dad was the last one and he was the only one to be born out here. He was born in 1900. God love him, he's gone on to be with the Lord. But that's, uh, that's they were truly the early day pioneers. Uh, in the de depression days came along, dad was, uh, dad was farming a half section of state land. And times was pretty tough and he lost his outfit. And I can remember leaving there my dad had a team of horses and a wagon and a bunch of furniture, all they had, on that wagon. And mom was driving the Model T. <laughs> and I can remember my dad crying. <laughs> it was tough for him to leave something that was, he wanted to farm, but the depression got to it. And so uh, that's just a little bit of history. Yeah, Deb, how did you, uh, I imagine through ranching and stuff, you got to get on a lot of colts and stuff, and uh, how did you get started cowboying and, and rodeoing in particular? Well, there was, uh, there was an old friend, Clint Kiner, uh, ranch right there to Elmira. And they run cattle, and times is tough. And I went to work for Glenn for $15 a month, and he was breaking colts. He'd take outside horses. He'd take outside horses, and uh, he got $15 a head to break those colts. And I was getting $15 a month. <laughs> that doesn't sound fair. And I can remember this one time. This really, this is. A, some kind of a memory. They had this big old Palomino <laughs> gilding snubbed up, and <laughs> I can hear old Glenn say to, the, to this day, he said, get in the middle of him, Deborah. <laughs> and down through that flat we went. But was, I, he broke, was he broke the ride when you got back? <laughs> we made a pretty good circle. <laughs> Anyway, it was from uh, from there I went to work for Ed Ring, and Ed had a little. He was he got into the buck and horse business later on, and he had a little. Uh, he had a buck and shoot right there on the place. Had a little gray mare that was just a dandy little practice horse, and I got to getting on her about ever <laughs> every time I could get them guys to to uh, let me take off from doing something else. I'd go and get on that little mare, and it's the first time I'd ever jumped out of a chute, you know. And I really got to liking it, and kind of made up my mind that that's what I was going to do with my life. 
that leads us up to when do you, when do you, when was your first rodeo? Do you remember when you entered your first rodeo? Yeah, it was in, I think about 1940. I went over to Keller and I entered the bareback riding and I can even remember the first horse I was on. It was a blue roan horse called Johnny Brushpile. Johnny Brushpile was an Indian over there on the reservation and uh, he brought this blue roan horse. Christensen Brothers had came up to put that little rodeo on and uh, I drew Johnny Brushpile. That's the first one I was ever on at a rodeo. And uh, I got a picture of it. Had a cigarette in my mouth. <laughs> I was really uh, playing the part, I guess. I thought you had to be. <laughs> well, that's true. There were lots of cowboys in that day uh, that had a cigarette in their mouth. That's right. When did you join the, uh, the Rodeo Cowboys Association? Oh, I think it was in the fall of 1960, or 50, no, 46, <laughs> and somewhere yeah. you in the fall of 46, I'll tell you how that happened, can I tell that story? Uh, Howard Pilgrim was, uh, he was the uh, representative for the Cowboy Turtle Association, and I'd gone to, uh, I'd gone to Calgary, I'd went to Pendleton, and uh, I was in the, I entered in the Northwest Prone Crowd at Pendleton, and uh, in the bull riding, and it was, after the rodeo was over there at Pendleton, I went, I placed in the bull riding in the, in the Northwest, and Howard Pilgrim told me, came to me, and he said, well, you went as far as you're going, buy you a card. <laughs> and in them days, that was what it was. If they told you you'd, you'd win enough and you you wasn't going to enter anymore, you got you a card. So that was in the, in the fall of 1960. Yeah, Deb Rodeo, his big rodeo years were in the 50s, early 60s, late 40s. Uh, tell us what you think the difference of rodeoing then and the way it is now, Deb. I don't know, Jack. Uh, you watch the finals. Uh, I think one thing that that I see more that uh, I didn't see in that day, there was Christensen Brothers, there was Matt Barber, there was Harley Tucker, there was Leo Mumon, Kelsey, and they all had some good, fine draws, good bucking horses. Hank and Bobby had uh, Satan's sister, Adam, Buck, uh, Try Me, and the horses that just jump and kick, and you could turn your toes out, really make good rides on them. But the thing that I see when I watch the finals, Kessler's have got, they went to raise in these big old feather legged, and they're, you know, they're, they call it the eliminator pin. <laughs> and I guess it's all right, but I'd not rather have followed and rode those good high kicking, good kind of bucking horses than these horses that throw them wild horse pits. And you never know from one time to the next what, what kind of a rain you're going to take on them. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that I see that's has more variance now than them. Uh, Deb, you uh, have raised a family. Actually, you've raised two families. Yeah. Uh, your first family, you had a son and a daughter, Jeff and Debbie. Uh, Debbie was a Miss Rodeo Washington. Jeff was a 1975 world champion calf roper. Tell us a little bit about, about those days. Well, there was... Uh, Pretty much just my world was rodeo, and that was that was kind of what it amounted to. And long towards the end of my rodeo career, it was pretty inevitable that that my first wife and I were going to make it. And I remarried, and I have two boys and a girl. I'd like to introduce my Cheryl. Cheryl, stand up, would you please? We've got, we've got 46 years together. 
Congratulations. Um, well, about some of the more down at that time, but some of your most memories of the cowboys you rodeoed with, and maybe some of the gals, that, the cow gals that you knew that rodeoed. Well, I think my favorite person of everybody that I knew, I love Bill Nitterman. He was as nice a friend, as good a cowboy, someone that you really looked up to. He was, he was such a um, guiding light to so many. And Bill and I, the last good years that I had, why Bill and I rented that 180 Cessna from Paul Templeton, Paul Lewis, and the best years that I had was in that old 180 Cessna. Bill and I rented it, and then we always had somebody else take the, the four seat, but uh, Casey was a good friend. I got a good story to tell you about Casey. We got long enough. We got plenty of time. He's probably up there trying to pull a prank on somebody right now. He's no kidding. He's probably is. Anyway, this morning we we uh, got over to Walla Walla and rodeoed there that night. Stayed all night at the old was it the Marcus Whitman? Anyway, the next morning we're without a ride back to Ellensburg, and Larry Larry Daniels. And Dwight Maddox just happened to come through the lobby. <laughs> and we said, we need a ride back to Ellensburg. Oh, come on, we got, Larry was fine. He had a little, a little Piper Cub. <laughs> and so uh, we agreed, and so we got our saddles and threw them in with him. And we flew it, and so we come into the valley, <laughs> Larry was one to really, you talk about a prankster. He, he loved to pull a, a dandy on you. And so this day, we, as, we, as we come into the valley, Larry says, we're going to do a little hay hopping. He said, not hitchhike hopping, we're going to do a little hay hopping. <laughs> and so he died in them days, he had those old big beaver slides and them old tall haystacks. <laughs> and he'd dive at them stacks and boom, <laughs> and he'd go over and boom, he'd go in the and the sheep would scatter and the cattle would scatter, and literally, it was chaos. <laughs> I was in the front seat, Casey was here, his wife was here, <laughs> Casey threw up right down my neck. <laughs> this is the God honest truth, and guess what? Dwight crapped his pants. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we dive at them and boom, oh, we got out of that. We got out of that plane. No, Dwight said. <laughs> this is, and we he got to the got up to the hangar. <laughs> just stripped off his clothes and just turned them inside out. <laughs> and just run them out and put them back on. <laughs> and that day, that day, uh, Casey's sister, Dolly and Lyle, they were from Seattle, and they had a lot of Casey's clothes. And so, <laughs> That shirt I had on wasn't worth And so we went to the car, and, and Lyle and Dolly had Casey's, and he had a blue checked shirt. And that day I had a horse called Export of Kelsey's. And I can show you that day, that blue checked shirt <laughs> that I had on was Casey's that I borrowed. <laughs> anyway, and I won a day money that day on Export. Dwight won a day money in the bull ride. <laughs> and so every time I look at that, that I got a picture of export at home. Every time I look about, I remember these the, the whole details. It was the funniest thing you'd ever have. Larry Daniels, we tried to kill him, but he wouldn't have to kill him. 
I have to tell you a little, a little story about Larry. You may have heard this one or been there what happened. This guy, uh, he was kind of tough, and he had a bull at Puyallup one year that I don't think he'd been ridden, but he said, I'll ride that son of a gun. And if you haven't been to the Western Washington Fair, they have all these acts and stuff. They had a high diver way up there, and he had a little bitty water trough at the bottom. And he said, if I don't ride that bull, I will go dive off of that, that platform. <laughs> well, he didn't ride the bull. Shaft, spurs, and everything, and hat. Larry went to the top of that thing and dove off into there. So that's what kind of a guy he was. <laughs> Oh, did, did you ever fly with Larry anymore after that, Deb? Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you this about Dwight. That fall, we went to New York. Dwight and Margie, my wife and I, we drove back. And the first thing we would out seeing the sights, <laughs> and we headed to the Empire State Building. And <laughs> We we got in that elevator and as we started up, old guy size just got a little bit barrel chested in. He was barrel chested anyway, and <laughs> the further to the top we got, boy, boy he blew up like a toad. <laughs> and he, he got out of that he got out of that uh, elevator door, and he just did this, and he was scared to death. There isn't any fear like this, you know? And he, we couldn't get him to go to the edge. We couldn't, he just went and we got ready. We finally called the elevator. And he stepped back over, back into it. And down there we went. I never did forget to quit kidding him about, but you know, that's a horrible fear. If you have that, and that day was, that was, that was rare. Tough to handle. I can see how it really was a bothering, you know. But what year you won the Bronc ride? What years? Was it 55 and 56? 55 and 56. Tell us, um, tell us a little bit about your Friday, the best years of your rodeo career. Well, it's like I said earlier, uh, Bill and I rented that plane. We we hired Paul, and we paid him four cents a mile. We paid him four cents a mile to fly us. Listen, four cents a mile. Did you, did you split that? Did you split four cents a mile? No. Oh, okay. But anyway, come fall, and we was going to, uh, Paul said, boys, he said, I'm going to have to go to a nickel. <laughs> he said, I got to do a major on this airplane. And I'm going to have to make a little bit more money. So he said, well, it's fine. So that fall, Bill and Paul and I and Bobby Robinson, we commuted between New York, Omaha, and Chicago. And I could, I could sit here the rest of the day telling you about those commuting between those three rodeos. <coughs> In the beginning, we landed back at... Uh, something happened to Paul's... <laughs> to his radio. He could send, but he couldn't receive. And so we just, we, here's all these airplanes that Paul just pulled into the, into the pattern, but there won't be planes that he'd come in and, and uh, just as we landed on the, hit the airstrip where the tower said, uh, Cessna, so-and-so, if you could read us, go to taxi strip so and so and stay there. <laughs> and then, so then the next the next uh, trip to Omaha, we got off out there, oh past Pennsylvania somewhere, and we got fogged in. <laughs> and we're sitting there waiting for the fog to lift, and finally Paul said to us, <laughs> he said if we if we uh, are going to do it, we're going to have to go. And it was still fogged in. We didn't even go ask if we could go. We just jumped in and <laughs> we went in. There was a river and going right there. And we just got on that river and we was coming out. It flew right out. We followed, we followed that river and 
guess what? Right up ahead was a big old bridge. <laughs> Paul says, boys, dump your heads. we got to go on there. <laughs> oh, mother, that thing we went. And guess what? We, we get out there. What's in five minutes? Boy, the sky opened up. And the sun was a shining. It was the most beautiful thing I could ever remember in my life. <laughs> Flying out of that poem. <laughs> anyway, that was another story. <laughs> how, how did the national finals change rodeo? Well, I got to tell you this. In 1958, in 1958, I was on the the RCA Board of Directors representing the Bronc Riders. And we always had a summer meeting at Cheyenne uh, for the full membership. And uh, we was meeting and after long towards the end of that day, uh, a guy came to us, listen to this story. A guy came to us and he said, gentlemen, I have a proposal. I want you to take it back and look it over. Praise God, it was the national finals. The national finals. We voted on it. And it wasn't unanimous. But there was enough of us that agreed that it would work. And we just give him a we give him an all. Go ahead. That was the first national finals rodeo. John Van Cronkite was the man that produced the first few years at Dallas. And I always say, that's one thing I'm truly proud of, that I got, that I had a, a voice in that. You know, that was a, it's been good for rodeo, especially in Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, since I'm a, a roper, did you ever try your hand at roping? Well, haven't raised a cab roper, you know I rope some, but. <laughs> When I, uh, you know, uh, Jim said, uh, Jack Wallace is going to kind of work on this interview with you. And you know, something, something rang a bell. A little brown horse called Chubby Cola. We called him, called him Coke. He'd come through the sale barn at Coeur Lane, and I bought him. And at that time, Jeff was a rope, and he was about 12, 13. And George Richmond lived across the valley over there. And every time I'd look up, Jeff would say, let's go to George's and rope. <laughs> so across the valley, we'd go. And when I bought this little brown horse, why I took him over there. Boy, he was some kind of a nice horse, wasn't he? Yeah, I got to tell you a little story. Deb isn't telling the whole thing. George, George Richmond is who he was talking about, who was a a real good roper from Montana and good friend of us and, and roped here at Gillenburg Rodeo a lot, of, a lot of times. But George tells me the story like this. Deb and I were over at the cattle sale at uh, Coeur Lane, and this nice little brown horse came through and they claimed he'd been roped on and this and that. And so Deb bought him. We better buy this horse. So they took him home and well, let's take him out to the ring and try him. So George ropes on him first, and George says, this little horse is really wanting to duck off, really go to the left. After I rope four or five, he said, you know, I had him going pretty decent. Jeff says, well, let me rope one on him. Are we close so far? <laughs> anyway, Jeff says, well, he looks pretty good. You know, George says, I'm really having a hold of him in there. He's really wanting to duck off. And so Deb, he gets on and goes and ropes one, and what happened after that? <laughs> the horse ducked a little bit, and I think duck, Deb had a little trouble staying on. So, but uh, to make a little more story out of it, uh, Jeff did rope on. I don't think Jeff probably did rope on that horse. No, I don't think so. But anyway, a, a guy up in, in um, uh, Spokane bought the horse, and his wife Western pleasured on him. And while they had him, George Richmond took him to the rodeos and mounted guys on him. Uh, Glenn Franklin, who was a world champion, Dale Smith, uh, a lot of guys rode that horse at Fenland in Calgary. And uh, he, they sold him to a guy down in Oregon. 
And then I was about 19 years old and I was wanting to rope and thought I could rope. And I'd worked and worked and worked. I gave $2,500 for that horse in 1966. My folks That's, <laughs> That's a lot of money then. But anyway, uh, Jeff uh, was a 1975 world champion calf roper. You being a bronc rider, Jeff being a calf roper, quite a, quite a difference there, Jeff. Um, how did you how did you feel you won a championship and he won a championship? Uh, what were the feelings there? Well, um, to raise a calf rover, <laughs> nobody nobody deserves this. <laughs> nobody deserves this, Jack. Due respect to your event, <laughs> but I have never in my life seen anybody grind themselves the way Jeff did. I remember we lived in Benton City, and it was one o'clock in the morning. The next day, they had they were going to play us uh, one of those town uh, towns down there in the valley for the state championship in football. Might have been uh, Jeff played against my brother who went to school here at Kittitas. So it was one of the like Connell or one of those other teams. That's right. Yep. Anyway, Jeff was the next day was the playoff for the state, and Jeff's out in the in the arena at one o'clock tying calves. And I I got up out of bed and I went out and I said, Jeff, Lord God, get some get to sleep. I said. You got uh, you got a playoff again tomorrow. I said, it's, "Isn't that important?" He said, "Dad, this is important to me." <laughs> and he was so devoted, Jack. Nobody drove themselves like he did. He just we practiced, practiced, and he wanted to, he wanted to win so bad and. A lot of people that's out there that's wanting to to win a championship, they could they could think about that very thought. Get devoted, get a good practice situation. You're only as good as your practice situation lets you be. Very good words, uh, Deb. Uh, you found the Lord over the last few years. You want to talk about that a little bit? You bet. Praise God. <laughs> uh, can I Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Come here. We got a little. I yeah. got a good friend with me today that I really love. He's. He. I've been a Noah and Clyde for 15 years, and he come to my place. He brought a Brit bear there and bred to my little black horse, and he's been a riding my bloodlines ever since. And uh, it was in the course of him coming there that that I I talked with Clyde about the Lord and he received Christ right there in my barn and I <laughs> he's like one of my kids I just love him we'd like to this is uh, Clyde James Clyde James you're going to sing a song for us we get things kind of organized here does, while they're setting up does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask any what about the horse you gave Bonnie Guitar? Uh, Mr. Brown, please. Um, I asked Bonnie to come with us today. I would have loved to. But she had a doctor's appointment. She lives in so so late. And uh, uh, she had a doctor's appointment yesterday and they advised her not. She's 87. But she can still build out a good song. And for those of you who have not heard of Bonnie Guitar, she made it to Nashville and had some big recordings out. And uh, oh, yeah. there was one other, somebody raised their hand about there about a question, yes? What memories do you have of Bronco Matt? Bronco Matt. What memories do you have of Bronco Matt? Bronco Matt. The question is, what memories do you have of the Bronco Matt? Oh, Tibbs beat me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst part about it. Before Deb starts, uh, the Bronco Mac was a big match bronc riding in OMAC 
in the 50s and the very top bronc riders in the world were invited to compete. So, your thoughts? Oh, I was awfully disappointed they discontinued them. Yeah, it was something. But uh, let me tell you how I feel about one event pulling away from the rest of them. I have no love for the PBR, point blank. They pulled out and left the rodeo business. They left the rodeo business, and I thought it was, I was never proud of that that whole concept, period. Yes? Did your son win the football game? Did your son win the football game? They did. <laughs> they went state. Yeah. Let me tell you, I'll elaborate on that just a little bit. Jeff was about half lazy when it comes to things besides roping. And he never liked to play defense. Jim spelled out he was the coach. And he told him, Jeff, he says, this is a defensive battle. Whoever plays the best defense is going to win this game. <laughs> Jeff played every second of defense. <laughs> Listen, let me, uh, let me just uh, elaborate a little. My faith, our faith, has become very important to us. Jeff, through uh, the Cowboys for Christ, came home from Cheyenne in the early 80s. And he was, he was a different person. I, I, I was running that bar there. And uh, Jeff came in, and boy, he was just, he was so excited, and he said, I, I asked him, I said, Lord, what's happened to you? Oh, Dad, he said, you'll never believe it. And he said, uh, he said, let's get out of here. He said, can we go over to the park? And it was just a little ways there from our, to the, he said, we went over to that park bench and sat across from each other, and he told me about this movement, the Cowboys for Christ. And he said, while my wife and I were back there in Cheyenne, he said, the first night, the second night, they had an altar call. He said, the third night, said, we broke and run. We got our knees and gave our self to the Lord. We accept him as our Lord and Savior. And I said to him, I said, well, there's a lot of terminology here that I'm not that familiar with. I said, do me a favor. I said, uh, before you get your soapbox and start to evangelize me, I said, you walk it for a year. Let me watch you. And I always like to say, we like what we saw. <laughs> In a year's time, Cheryl and I and our whole family come to Christ. And uh, it's been 30 years. And these have been the best times of my life. Rodeo on was good. But knowing God and serving God and seeing the joy that it's brought to me and my family, there isn't anything that will compare with it. Even being the championship, a champion of the world doesn't even um, hold a cannon to it. Please believe that. Well, thank you, Deb. As I'm sitting here, you remember you were talking about Bill, Bill Linderman a little while ago? I see his granddaughter sit, standing right right back there. <laughs> Might have to talk with her Hi, a little bit. <laughs> Great, how are you? Uh, Listen, I, there's, a, there's a song that I like to sing, and it's called The Place Where I Worship. My Clyde's going to help me with it. Okay. Oh, the place that I worship is the wide open places Touched by the hand of the Lord Where the trees of the forest Are like pipes of the organ While the breeze plays an aiming chord Where the stars, they're like candles And they light up the mountain Mountains, they're altars of God. Cause the place 
that I worship is our Lord. I love that song. It fits so many of us. So many of us here are outside people. We ride in the mountains. And I just wouldn't... The first time I heard this song, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans in New York. And they came to the Lord in 1952. And they wanted to add this song to their... And close their act with this song. And old Frank Moore, he was the gentle man, says, Oh! It'll never work, Roy says, it'll never work. Said, this is a Jewish town. Said, they, there wouldn't be a soul up there in them seats. He said, well, you get yourself another yodeler then. <laughs> anyway, he sang it, and every night I'd hear these words, and it did something. It sowed some seed in me, and I, I'm glad they, they took root. Clyde, Clyde sings a good song, and I just, I just brought him over here, and and uh, you got to sing that song. I love Which it. one? Uh, Jim, I'm worried Jim. Today. Jim, I'm I love this today. song. Listen to it. Well, I think everybody's recorded this but me. <laughs> I'm kind of new to this. I was, got to hang around with Deb, and he said, well, you can back me up on a guitar. And I said, nah, I never even played one. But I picked it up about eight years ago. Jim. I wore a tie today, first one that I ever wore. Well, Jim, I did everything I could, but your fever just wouldn't die down. So last night I put your horse to the wagon and I brought you to town. But when I got there, Jim, you was gone. There wasn't nothing nobody could do. So I bought you a suit and tie, Jim. Well, today, I wore one too. Jim, I wore a tie today, the first one that I wore. And you'd have said, I look like a dummy out of a dry store. Well, Jim, they said a lot of things. I don't remember one thing they said. My mind kept wandering back down the trail, back to the time we had. Riding the herd, the wind and the rain, adding for gold on the cot. We did everything the book I guess, some things they never thought of. Well, Jim, you're riding on ahead, I guess that's the way it's got to be. When you reach those streets that are paved with gold, take out a claim for me. Jim, I wore a tie today, the first one that I wore. We have time for one more song. Leaves a peaceful feeling in my mind. Waking up in the morning with an eagle overhead makes me long to fly away before my time. I think I. Thank you. 
country is so pretty, it goes on and on for miles, and it takes away my trouble and my care. Thank you, Clyde and Deb.